Let's talk a little bit about control engineering at Purdue in the mid-1960s. I have to admit, in all honesty, I'm a bit un uncomfortable about this because I'm admitting my, to my age, and I don't like doing that. I like to lie. So first, let me uh, just mention what the basic control group in electrical engineering was. I was in the electrical engineering department. Uh, the head guy was a guy named John Gibson, Jack Gibson who wrote a book in the 19, way back then on nonlinear control. The book is still available. He was a reasonably well-known guy. He, I was a graduate student at the University of Arizona in Tucson, and he came to visit and he managed to recruit me. So I came up to Purdue and uh, there was a group, uh, Violet Haas, I know you know who she is because uh, uh, she was a member of the, of the control group. She, um, was a strong promoter of, of, of getting women into engineering, and uh, she was very good at it. Her husband, Felix Haas, was the provost, and I believe there's a building at Purdue named after him at this point. So Gibson was my advisor when I first went to Purdue, and uh, he left for another school at some point, and Violet Haas took over and became my advisor till I finished. Another member of the group was Boyd Pearson, who was an assistant professor at Purdue at the time and went on to Rice University where he filled out his career. Pearson um, uh, was is quite well known uh, in the control community. Uh, the connection between him and me at Purdue was that um, I took linear systems from him and he taught me linear systems using the book Matrix Algebra or something by Gantmacher. I don't know how many of you have seen that book, but it was a predecessor to the well-known Horn and Johnson books. Gantmacher was actually, is actually a very, very good book, but it uh, takes some effort to learn some of what's in it. I particularly remember agonizing with Pearson over elementary divisor theory, uh, but uh, I did learn something, and of course, the only way to learn something is to go through some pain. And I certainly went through a lot of pain at that point. Another person in the group who I'm sure some of you know is King Sung Fu, Chaos Fu, who was into pattern recognition. Fu uh, has gone on to great prominence. There is an award by the Pattern, uh, pattern Recognition Society. I don't recall exactly what the name is, but it's the Chaos <coughs> Fu Prize. <coughs> Another person who you probably don't know who was part of the group was Zeno Rakeshis, uh, who eventually went on to Northwestern. Uh, he did some work in non-interacting control, which influenced me for work that I did later in my career. And finally, Antti Koivo, who I think stayed at Purdue and must still be around. Uh, I think he joined Purdue around the time that I got there. Um, so I got to know him pretty well. I also got to know his younger brother. In, in Finland, uh, who hosted me at a very wonderful event in connection with an IFEC Congress, which was held in Helsinki. Uh, in addition to these people, there was one other guy, Sid Schreeder, I couldn't find his picture. He uh, was a very smart fellow, I think interested in stochastic control, who left Purdue to go to Caltech during the time that I was there. Unfortunately, he passed away at a very young age. Two other people in the group were uh, Kashyap, who I think stayed at Purdue. He joined after I got to Purdue. And uh, Digafirito, Digafir who uh, also came to Purdue and then left uh, a little bit later on. So this was, roughly speaking, the group of people in control in electrical engineering. I may have forgotten somebody. There was a guy named Johnson Liu who came later on, but I absolutely could not find that any information on him uh, from the internet. <clears throat> so in addition to people in electrical engineering, there were a number of other people in uh, control in Purdue. Per perhaps the most well-known of these was Rufus Oldenberger, who is a very well-known uh, control guy in mechanical engineering. Uh, I can tell you that I was listening to the Dean talk today about your center, and I'm delighted to see that it's cross-departmental cross lines 
back in the days of Oldenburger and Gibson, there were there were wars between the departments and there was no collaboration at all, which was very silly, but that's the way the personalities were at that time in history. Uh, so Oldenburger has an award, an ASME award in his name. He's very well known. Another guy uh, back in that area from the math department was Leonard Berkowitz, who I think passed away in the last couple of years. Berkowitz was very much into optimal control and We'll make reference to him again. He was on my committee. He taught me optimal control. He's a very, very nice, smart guy. Another guy who came to Purdue uh, from industry was Ted Williams, who went to uh, chemical engineering, uh, and I got to know him pretty well. And another one I can remember uh, was Leo Chua, who I think many of you would know is going off to Berkeley. He was an assistant professor at Purdue when I got to Purdue. He didn't really do control, he did nonlinear systems. And some of the things that I think made him famous, he may have been talking about while he was at Purdue. Uh, uh, he invented a circuit element, if I remember correctly. One other guy I should mention, uh, because of his influence on control, was Julius Chow, Tao. Uh, Tao actually left Purdue before I got to Purdue, maybe by a year or two. Uh, but he was very influential. He went on to the University of Miami and has written many, many textbooks on control, which you could just Google his name, you'll start seeing them. Uh, one thing that, that I think he had to do with, uh, which I do with West Lafayette, was um, a Chinese restaurant. So at the time that I was in Lafayette, things were pretty bleak. They were not so good as far as restaurants, in fact, they were horrible. There was on Northwestern Avenue, very close to the electrical engineering building, a Chinese restaurant, which was very good. And I think Tao played a role in bringing that particular restaurant about. In fact, for a while, I thought that he was a co-owner, but maybe I was wrong. The restaurant was good enough so that people from uh, uh, Champaign-Urbana would drive all the way to West Lafayette just to go to the restaurant. So that's where things were in the 1960s. Uh, I had a bunch of office mates, some of whom you will know. Uh, this guy, probably not, Syed Murtuza, was um, an office mate who stayed at Purdue, but not the West Lafayette campus. I think he went to a satellite campus. Another guy, Lloyd Jones, who didn't even stay in control. He went to become a minister. The third guy you'll know, George Cerritos. Uh, George went on to uh, be instrumental in the development of the IEEE uh, uh, automation and remote control, automation and robotics and automation society. And um, there is an award in his name uh, given by the robotics and automation society. He shared knowledge with me and Phil Swain, who was on the Purdue faculty, I believe until he retired. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. Um, and there was one more guy I'll mention who was a, a student of, uh, Berkowitz, who's a mathematician, Tom Banks, who went on to do, among other things, become the editor-in-chief of Siam Journal of Control and Optimization, which some of you may know has been one of the leading top two journals in the control field, and I've had ongoing contact with him. Uh, let me talk a little bit about some of the research things that were going on at Purdue uh, during the years that I was there. Absolutely for sure, the big uh, game was optimal control, the maximum principle, people were beginning to uh, discover it, dynamic programming due to Bellman, linear quadratic optimal control had been pushed hard by Mike Athens at MIT, gradient algorithms and quasi-linearization were being proposed to solve the uh, Euler-Lagrange equations which go with uh, the principle, uh, the maximum principle. So there was a lot of work uh, in this area and I participated in this as well. Other area, uh, another area of research, maybe less so, but still active, was uh, stability theory, nonlinear stability theory, and the Puna functions were certainly around at Purdue, and the circle criterion had been developed in uh, the, the early 1960s by various people, not at Purdue, but it was uh, certainly being studied. Uh, stochastic control was another area of study. Um, nonlinear control, uh, I think the main tool in nonlinear control was describing functions. There was absolutely no uh, uh, 
nonlinear geometric control theory. That did not develop until the 1970s. Uh, differential games were very popular back then. Um, in fact, I was um, studying, uh, I studied differential games. It was part of my doctoral thesis. Uh, the name Rufus Isaacs, who was not, not at Purdue, but he was a big name in differential games. And of course, Kalman filters and observers. Observers had just been invented a, a year or two earlier, I think, by Dave Leuenberger. Kalman filters were a little bit older. Realization theory, controllability and observability, and things related to that were certainly being studied. And that was also Kalman uh, work, which, which had actually come originally out of the circuits field. Uh, there were applications to space travel, which I was involved in. Uh, this was in the 1960s, so it was before the United States, not only before we went to uh, the moon, but before uh, the United States really made much of a presence in, um, in space. Um, i trying to remember the story of, um, I can't remember, there was a story to do with Sputnik, which goes back to 1957, uh, but I can't, sorry, I can't remember the story. Uh, but what I can remember is that when we worked on, there was a group of us at Purdue during my graduate days who worked on something called model vehicle number two. Model vehicle number two was a post Saturn V class vehicle, which was a real big vehicle. And we were concerned with controlling it. It, it like Saturn V, it had gimbaled engines on the bottom and you controlled it by swiveling the engines. Uh, the thrusts were not under control, they were pre-programmed. And uh, it, it was, the problems were extremely challenging because of the size of the vehicle. So things like bending frequencies, bending modes became important and became part of the control problems. And so we studied that. This was, uh, Purdue was one of four universities in the United States funded by NASA to work on, uh, I believe, model vehicle number two. Eventually that whole program was scrapped, it has like many programs in the government. Finally, there's the um, pole placement. And I wanna tell a story about pole placement. I actually have a movie, but uh, I'm a little worried about time. How much time do I, do I have a lot of time? Yeah, we've got essentially until noon. Um, and of course, oh. if people drop out, that's totally fine. But you know, the, yeah, the, this is essentially uh, why we're here and please take your time with it. All right, let me move to the movie. I was debating whether to do this, but I think that I will. Oh, that's not it. Okay, so what does this have to do with broccoli? What does pole placement have to do with broccoli? So, here's the answer and this does have something to do with Purdue. Well, first I should tell this movie. You can't hear sound. You can hear that? Uh, we couldn't hear that. Oh, well, that's very unfortunate. That's George Bush Sr. saying, oh, oh, I do not like broccoli. I know like it since I was a little kid. My mother made me eat broccoli. I'm not gonna eat any more broccoli. That's a famous bit. And um, what does that have to do with uh, the story I'm gonna tell? So I've used this in presentations and what I start by saying is I don't like optimization. When I was at Purdue, all I studied was optimization. I'm not gonna use optimization anymore. And so what does that, just to make people laugh. And uh, uh, what does that have to do with, with um, with pole placement? So here's the, here's the story. When I was at Purdue, people were kind of fanatical about optimization. I mean, it was excessive. During my stay, some guy came in, this was before a post-placement theorem was, came up, 
some guy came in to give a talk on placing the poles of a linear system under state feedback. And his idea was to set this up as an optimization problem. So the, the problem was to actually to adjust the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of A plus B F with, with the entries of the matrix F. And so the entries of the matrix, uh, sorry, uh, the, the characteristic polynomial of A plus B F, of course, determines the eigenvalues. So unfortunately, the coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of A plus BF are nonlinear, actually multilinear functions of the entries of the matrix F. So that if you set up an optimization problem, it's fairly easy to set up a problem, such a problem, where if you could find the minimum, you would have a solution to the pole placement problem. But the catch is you can't find the minimum because the optimization problem is highly non-convex. And the reason I mentioned this story is because it's a perfect example of what I would call very uncreative research. When I got done at Purdue, I went to uh, NASA Research Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Murray Warnham was there and he had just proved his pole placement theory. He didn't use any optimization at all. So the, the message that I'm trying to get across is beware of people who try to convert every problem into an optimization problem. It's not creative often does nothing, uh, I would be very, very skeptical about that. I'll give you an, another example, two other examples of problems where people have attempted to set, set them up as optimization problems and really gotten nowhere. One of them is a matrix completion problem. Uh, you're trying to, you have holes in a matrix and you're trying to uh, put the entries in to end up with a positive definite matrix. And uh, so people have studied that as a optimization problem, it's stupid, in my opinion. Another example of such a problem is uh, network localization problems. Uh, if you want to do um, locally localize, find the positions of a bunch of sensors in the sensor network uh, using localization. Uh, the, algorithm, the, the basic problem because of, of Pythagoras is nonlinear. And so to try to deal with it by setting it up as an optimization problem goes nowhere, but people have done that. So I, th those of you who are starting out in your careers ask you to think twice before you run off and set things up as an optimization problem. There's more to life than optimization. Okay, I'll go on a little further now. So I mentioned some notable visitors that came to Purdue during the year that I was during the years that I was there. First one was Manfred Thoma. Thoma, you may know, uh, was a very active member of the International Federation of Automatic Control and recently, uh, uh, re re retired recently. And um, there's an award in his name. And I believe uh, uh, Ming Chao, who was my student, was the inaugural winner of the award, but I'm not sure. But anyway, there's an IFAC award in this guy's name. Tomo was a very nice guy, a very funny guy. He was German, so he, he, his English was a bit abrupt. I remember having a conversation with him one day uh, and asked him, he said he was going to go on vacation. I said, where? He said, to the West. He was going to visit about six or seven states. I said, how long are you going to, are you, and he's going to drive. How long are you going to take to do that? He said, two weeks. And my eyes rolled. Any of you who've been in the West know that you can, can't get very far in two weeks. Uh, visiting six or seven states. Another guy uh, who I think you all know who visited Purdue in the 1960s was Rudy Kalman. Um, I won't say anything about him, but I will say that other than the fact that when he visited, I had no idea that he was a celebrity, a big deal. I was just a young uh, graduate student. Uh, I have since written an article, it would appear in the Control System magazine as part of a tribute to Kalman, appeared a couple of years ago, which you might want to read because I do mention Purdue and, and uh, that particular incident, and along with a number of fun, funny incidents involving Kalman that I know about. Another guy who visited Purdue back in that time was Latvi Zada. Uh, Zada was just beginning to talk about fuzzy sets, and he gave a talk on that subject at Purdue, which I remember. Another guy who visited uh, many times was uh, Robert Caliber, who was a, a colleague of uh, Bellman. Uh, and uh, 
well known in his own right in, in the in mathematics uh, for optimization, contributions to optimization. And he pushed an idea of quasi, called quasi linearization, which is a computational technique for trying to solve um, Euler Lagrange equations, and I, something that I had a lot, lot to do with when I was at Purdue. Two other guys you may not know, the younger faculty, the younger graduate students may not know. One is called Gamkleritsa, and the other one's called Mashenko. Mashenko definitely came to Yale at the invitation of um, Berkowitz, Len Berkowitz in the math department. Uh, Gamkleritsa may also have come, but I can't remember because it was so long ago. And some of you may say, who cares? Who, who are these guys? Well, you can tell by their names that they're Russian. Remember, they were coming to the United States at a time when relations between Russia, between the Soviet Union and the United States were not so great. So when they came, like any other Russian visitor, there was always another person from the KVD, from the Russian secret police, who were watching to make sure they didn't escape. But who are these particular guys? This ought to help you figure out who they were. The, this is a paper, the original paper on the maximum principle. They are the second and third author of the paper, and Pontryagin is the fourth. So they're really a big deal uh, in optimization circles. So let me go on and uh, talk a little bit more about um, notable Boilermaker, who was at Purdue. So I no, I'm not talking about the International Brotherhood of Boilermakers. I'm talking instead about Bob Greasy. Bob Breezy was the quarterback of the Purdue football team, uh, at least during one of the years that I was there, and uh, uh, Purdue went to the Rose Bowl. Uh, and uh, I want, uh, my comments now are really directed towards the international students about, about this. I strongly urge you to go to a football game after the pandemic, uh, not because you have to be a great lover of American football, but because it is a happening. It is an experience which I think you will enjoy because it's so unusual. Uh, there will be things like tailgate parties before the game, and there will be uh, the behavior of the uh, fans is a little crazy. Everything about the event is, uh, is unusual, and it's worth going just for the fun of it, sort of like going to a World Cup soccer game, I guess, a similar kind of thing. So I urge you to do that. Uh, Researching this talk, I, of course, was led to this uh, Boilermaker uh, sign by accident. I was not led to it by Googling Boilermakers. I was led to it by Googling locomotives and Purdue. And unfortunately, what I was looking for, I never got, but what I did get was this. And this is where the name Boilermakers I don't know if it's where it comes from, but it's closely related. This is a steam locomotive given to Purdue. It's called the Schenectady, and it comes from Schenectady, New York, which makes me think it has something to do with um, General Electric, which was in Schenectady. If you look carefully, you'll notice that uh, it says Purdue University 1890 something. So this goes back quite a few years. And the reason it went to Purdue is because this was an era in which uh, steam engines were really a big deal as far as commerce is concerned. And so people wanted to make sure that they were being operated as efficiently as possible. Purdue had some kind of a, a steam engine laboratory or something back then. And uh, so Purdue was given this engine to study it to see if they could make it behave better. And through this process, I believe the term bo Boilermakers uh, emerged. But I'm, so what led me to this was not trying to find out where the term Boilermaker came from, but rather something a little different. As it turns out, during the years that I was at Purdue, there was a locomotive on campus. Not only was it on campus, it was functioning. So I lived in the what used to be called the married student courts, and they were on the corner of, um, of State Street and Airport Road. And in order for me to get to the electrical engineering building, I'd walk down State Street and then I'd start walking across the campus. And not too far into that walk, there would be a railroad track. And on that railroad track was a modern locomotive, not an old steam engine like this, and a coal car. And that um, 
I can't remember if the steam engine, if the engine, if it was a steam, I don't think it was a steam engine. I think it was, uh, when I was there, it was probably a uh, diesel engine. And the role of that particular uh, engine was to carry coal from some location, which I don't know, I don't know where it was, to the physical plant, which generated the heat for the whole university. And uh, I think that was there all the years that I was at Purdue, but I can't remember. And anyway, I know the next time I came to visit, it was gone. So uh, that kind of brings me to the end of my talk, a little bit of discussion about Purdue. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. And uh, especially thank you, you know, for the review of the uh, history of uh, Purdue control.